I see several people uh, joining. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm very pleased you're here. We see that several attendees are already making it. So we are gonna kick off um, and hopefully uh, the other guests will join us in a few. Um, so just to start, welcome everyone to the kickoff of the Urban Design Otherwise series. I'm Catalina Ortiz, Associate Professor at the Development Planning Unit and Co-Program Leader of the Master in Building and Urban Design and Development. Today, I'm delighted to host our first event of the series with a powerful lineup of guests. Before introducing them, uh, I want to start with a quote and then outline briefly the purpose of the series and the topic of today's event. Uh, to start, the future is not it, it's no one's property, no need to shackle it, no otherwise, not otherwise as in the political horizon awaits, otherwise as in a firm embrace of the unknowable, the unknowable as in a well of infinity, I want us all to fall down together, otherwise the future is now and all those political promises we make to one another, all the wishing and hoping in earnest. This is from uh, Lola Lufemi recent book in experimenting and imagining otherwise. I think this quote captures the spirit of long-term set of struggles drawing inspiration on the political project of the Latin American critique of modernity coloniality collective and thinkers such as Florian Sandua, Silvia Rivera Kosikansky, or most recently how this critique has been seen with the nexus uh, with design and with the work of uh, Dan Abdullah, Arturo Escobar, and even Lola Lufemi herself, just to name a few. Thinking urban design otherwise invites to change the terms of the conversation that the canon of the modern coloniality has imposed on design thinking. But we are also cautious as we are witnessing a rising interest around the coloniality in the Anglo-Saxon academia and wonder to what extent it is just a trend and a brutal plea for radical change or an organic response to the long durée of Western Central perspectives. Perhaps is the current gesture of white innocence or the new fashionable world that give currency to the ego of many academics. Whatever is the reason, we must remain vigilant of the cooptation of white Western scholars of the vocabularies of the coloniality and always acknowledge the coexistence of several regional genealogies of the intellectual inquiry grounded in a political praxis to the critiques of the impacts of coloniality and enact anti-colonial struggles. It is against this backdrop that the collective intellectual project of the master in urban design sits in the intersection of critical urban theory, critical design studies, and the Southern urban practice. For us, urban design otherwise offer a space to think together how to enact and foster emancipatory spatial practices. As designers and urban professionals, we're faced with the mission of creating and imagining new worlds. This mission has to confront the rise of the COVID pandemic, climate change emergency, the resurgence of nationalist regimes and white supremacy, all of which add to the long-standing societal problems such as racial injustices, structural inequalities, and the violent legacies of colonialisms. All processes where urban design has played a significant role in shaping through the spatial reproduction of privilege and control. In response to this, urban design history of complicity uh, requires a recalibration of thinking and practice around the discipline needs on the one hand, a critical examination of theories, methodologies, and pedagogies. And that is the project that we are embarking on. And we keep uh, building um, and thinking and reflecting upon. Um, this requires uh, acknowledging different theories, methodologies, um, and try to go beyond the realities and the dominant Western perspectives that bring solutionism and an anthropocentric model of thought that needs to be dismantled. It's with great, great pleasure that today uh, we're going to have a starting conversation of some brilliant troublemakers in the field of uh, spatial design, questioning the assumptions and proposing different methods to thinking and doing otherwise. Today's event is entitled Towards Anti-Colonial Design, a Methodological Approach to Activist Practice. And today we're gonna to be thinking through um, with our colleagues, what are the possibilities for emancipatory practices? For new narratives to emerge, we need to unmake 
uh, what we know, to look for radical approaches and practices that allow us to understand our responsibility as designers, to create a counter storytelling and nurturing radical hope. It's with great pleasure that I'm gonna introduce uh, to Leopold Lambert, who is the editor-in-chief of The Funambulist, um, a great editorial project that uh, most of you must be familiar with. He's a trained architect, as well as the author of three books that examine the inherent violence of architecture and bodies and its political instrumentalizations at various scales and in various geographical contexts. He's the author of Weaponized Architecture, The Impossibility of Innocence, uh, Topai, topi, topi, <laughs> The Corporeal Politics of the Clothes, um, and La Politique de Bulldozer, uh, which I cannot pronounce in French, <laughs> and his new book called States of Emergency, A Spatial History of the French Colonial Continuum. He will be speaking about the project of the Finambulist and as a toolbox for reflecting on the struggle, solidarity, and the built environment. Over to you, Leopold. Thank you very much, Catalina, for this great introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, Given that we're missing Cruz and Natalie for the moment, I'm wondering if I should not increase a tiny bit my, my scope uh, of, of what I was going to pre present today. So perhaps I think I'll, I'll try that by essentially, in addition of presenting the phenomenalist itself, perhaps giving a little bit of um, a little bit of a of an input of where where I'm coming from, quite literally, uh, when it comes to to doing that work as an editor, and it goes through um, it goes through my work as a as a trained architect uh, and and turned into writer, and perhaps also that's useful because um, I usually I usually present my trajectory as someone who started by trying to bring politics to the field of architecture and 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 i think to a certain degree that's what i'm still trying to do in some some instances i mean depending on the audience of course um but but like very much trying to especially in these first books that i had written weaponized architecture uh trying to show how architecture is inherently violent um and uh and and how this violence is inherent sort of physical violence is always instrumentalized politically, uh, and of course, more often than not, I mean, almost always, really, uh, for, uh, for for a crystallization of the dominant order. Um, and so, so my trajectory went from this to maybe bringing architecture to politics. If I if I sort of take the if I if I do the, the little flipping um, in that case, so from from bringing politics to architecture to bring to bringing architecture to politics, and uh, which is very much what the phenomenalist tries to do, uh, at least to a certain extent. So perhaps just to 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 give you a little a little bit more uh, of a, of an insight of what 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 it looks like from uh, from my position of a, as a writer before I, I go to like my main cap, if I may say, as an editor. Uh, it's been it's been uh, works that I tried to do in particular in Occupied Palestine, um, uh, where, of course, architecture is used as a settler colonial weapon uh, uh, pretty much everywhere on the on the on the ground of, of uh, historical Palestine. So that means, of course, uh, the West Bank, uh, Gaza, and what is commonly known today as Israel. Um, and uh, and more recently, it's it's been um, moving from Palestine. I, I also try to do it within um, what I call the colonial continuum, the French colonial continuum. So very much a space time of colonialism, um, and uh, looking in particular at this uh, legislation of uh, the state of emergency, the French state of emergency, which is uh, uh, quite you know that follows quite closely uh, the the British colonial state of emergency that was. Uh, used in uh, Malaya in the 40s and uh, in Kenya in the 50s. Um, and so and so that that looked at uh, a few a few of those uh, application of the state of the colonial state of emergency during the Algerian revolution in particular on the indigenous indi indigenous land of Kanaki in New Caledonia which is still a French colony today as well as in what we call the banlieue in France which is like uh, working class, uh, working class social housing uh, 
estates where uh, a majority of of inhabitants are actually uh, have the, where themselves or or their family used to be a colonial subject of the French colonial empire. So I, I look at it both from the side of the colonial violence and the resistance against this violence and against colonialism, uh, and try to to use my also to use my skills as architect to sort of make it representable uh, some way to, to cartograph it, and including when time is involved as as here. So yeah, so that was <laughs> just to 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 give a slightly longer introduction to where I'm coming from. But now going to the to the main project, really what occupies uh, most of my life, really, uh, especially this kind of week where I'm finishing uh, finalizing the new issue. So the Phenomenalist is um, uh, started twelve years ago already, but it started as a, as an online platform, just a, a blog, really. Uh, where back then I was I was uh, I was trying, you know, along along. Uh, Along the lines of what I was uh, describing for weaponized architecture, I was I was trying to write indeed about uh, like smaller pieces about uh, weaponized architecture. Uh, it became a podcast in 2013, and then in 2015, I wanted to take a leap of faith and uh, and be full time on it, and and that's how I created a, a print magazine uh, that comes out every other month, and then um, and then the, the main. Yeah, so we we already published thirty eight of them, uh, and uh, present a little bit about it. So those are the very first ones, which, as you can kind of tell just from looking at titles, are still quite architectural and very much literal in in this idea of bringing architecture to politics. And when I say architecture, I of course mean it in a, I mean in a way that probably many of us are are using it like you know in a very in a very broad way, going from the scale of territories to the very scale of objects or clothes. Um, those are the from May 2017 to December 2018, where things uh, try to di diversify a little bit in the approach of the topics uh, that we were. Uh, and I guess also from, from an I, we became a we because uh, uh, there started to be a, a little team. Uh, only only a few months ago, the, where did I manage to 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 make this team a permanent one with two people, including myself, working full time? But even back then, we we had a, 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 so um, we had a, a, a small team building up, um, and then in 2019, I started to realize that. We had been quite good at describing, at sort of, at sort of analyzing uh, colonial violence, and not just colonial, of course, struct structural racist violence, ableist violence, uh, misogynistic and queer phob queerphobic uh, violence. But it's true that the, the colonial violence might might be like the main uh, the main object of analysis. But we we'd been quite good at analyzing it, but we, somehow it was lacking a little bit of. Um, I mean, not in all article, but in in general, the feeling of of the magazine was perhaps lacking a little bit of a, what I would call like a constructivist uh, dimension, like the the the, the fact of really um, trying to promote the struggles and look at look at what political struggles are creating, which is a bit more complicated than than just analyzing the violence itself. But uh, I think at, in the end, like much more. Um, much more in the lines of what what it is we're trying to do, which is to 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 be useful for those political struggles and to and to um, uh, and to cultivate internationalist solidarity in particular. Um, and so this gave this uh, 2019 series of uh, of issues trying to really uh, promote some aspects of uh, of the struggle each time. Um, so including uh, I, I just I mean it's very hard to pick like four articles out of um, uh, four articles out of one year of publication but I each time I try to I try to pick a few um, in 2020 we we also you know I mean after we had published already 26 issues so we also tried uh, a few new things uh, doing an issue, uh, uh, an issue in collaboration with the Palestine Festival of Literature, for example, 
or doing an issue with um, a young uh, South African uh, graduate, uh, Ron Moodley, uh, who's absolutely uh, stunning and, uh, and who illustrated like uh, historical battles of, of ours uh, around, around the world. Um, uh, then two beautiful issues, reparations and Pan-Africanism, where we also tried uh, to get out of our comfort zone sometimes, and Pan-Africanism was, uh, was the first time uh, uh, an issue edited, uh, not just by myself, but also by my two team members back then, uh, who are now part of the advisory editorial board of the Finland list in the persons of uh, Margaret and Zuzi Wako and Caroline Memoria. So those are a few examples from the, the Palestine issue, the battles issue, the reparation issue, the Pan-Africanism issue. And then this, this year that we were finishing, um, we tried uh, again, like some, some new things, like thinking of the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune from a very internationalist uh, point of view, thinking about ecology, which is which we have done a little bit, but uh, but not enough, but also like, being absolutely, uh, how do you say, being very deliberate about not possibly talking about ecology without talking about decolonization, uh, talking about time, which was quite a, uh, which is something that as architects we're not that used to do, but that, that is just as uh, a political dimension as space. Um, this in this fall we had a we had the great honor to have a, a full issue guest edited by Zoe Zamuzi. Uh, and uh, <laughs> good I see Cruz is coming so I can <laughs> I can stop stalling a bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then our most uh, most recent issue on music and the revolution with uh, an incredible cover by uh, South African artist Paula Manelli. We we started we started having like uh, covers uh, commissioned by artists themselves, which is which is truly wonderful. And Cruz just came in right at the moment where I get to show how uh, he and Natalie, as a, as why architecture think tank, uh, um, uh, were parts of um, were part of the the time issue on uh, in particular with their incredible uh, space time map of uh, of. Uh, of white supremacy in white supremacy system in relationship to the history of architecture. Uh, going a little bit behind the scenes, uh, this is this is was the team that I was uh, I was describing just uh, just a moment ago. Uh, is uh, at the office with me right now. Uh, our head of communication, Shirangi Mariam Raj. Uh, five members of an advisory editorial board uh, or former members of the of the editorial team. And recent co and regular collaborators. Uh, this talking again about the sort of the politics behind, um, like the politics of production and not just the politics of content of the of the magazine. Uh, this is a map that's quite useful for us to um, uh, to to wander. I mean, to to have like a a look at where uh, the various geographies we've been describing uh, in those thirty nine issues. Uh, 40s issue, uh, no, 39 issues, yeah, because uh, the new one is also on, the, the next one is also here. Um, and, you know, and as much as, as much as many aspect, you know, in our commitments to internationalism, many aspect of this index is quite satisfactory in the fact that we're not, you know, we're not like centered on the global north and then having like a, a, a couple, a couple of other geographies mobilized. Uh, so we can maybe be satisfied about that, but also also noticing very strongly some some areas where uh, clearly we have to do a better a better job. And and you know the, the biggest sort of area world area where we would we would need to do a, big, a, a better job, I, I believe, would be South America in particular. Uh, recently, we we started a system that I I'm really really liking, uh, which is. To also, you know, make the magazine available to 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 all, uh, because the magazine is like self-sustaining economically. So we are we have like a big base of subscribers, which manage to pay for two salaries essentially, plus the contributors, plus many like all the things that are related to producing the magazine itself. But so the systems that we started to to implement is. Um, is that every time we run out of print of a copy of an issue, 
we place it in open access on the website. So, so we're able to, to offer the content to, to everyone. And so for the moment, it's, it's already the case of, uh, many is that? It's uh, 17, 17 issues. And there will be some more uh, pretty soon because we are reaching the end of, of the stock for quite a few issues, which is quite encouraging. Uh, there's still a podcast existing in relationship to, to the magazine. I don't know why this image is pixelated. But, um, and, uh, and so that's also another open access platform uh, working with the, with the magazine. And, and then also not forgetting from where we're, from where we are speaking, most of the time, I mean, most of us are are not only in France but also in Paris specifically, and so doing an, doing two podcast series in, uh, in particular in French, one dedicated to the history of the Quartier Populaire, which is sort of similar word words than the the Bonlieu one that I was using earlier, uh, but so like basically neighborhoods of the of the racialized working class, if we may say it like that. Uh, and then one one podcast as well on the history and the political imaginary of diasporas in France that are uh, not the, the sort of the main diasporas that we usually think about when we think of the anti-racist struggle, which tend to be uh, very much either Maghrebi or West African or Afro-Caribbean. Uh, and so thinking of the many other diasporas that uh, we ought to know. And lastly, um, lastly, of course, our contributors are the relationship with our contributors is uh, is absolutely uh, fundamental, uh, and the way we can sort of create a community with at least I mean you know uh, I'm not gonna lie like it's not like we are always in contact with our 450 contributors all the time, but uh, there is something quite strong in in the way uh, the way this sort of community of thinkers and activists and artists have been, and designers. Um, the relationship we've been having, uh, we've been having with them throughout the years and how we're, we're sort of keep building it uh, issue after issue. And, and of course, many people have, have contributed more than once. So that's also something we're trying to do. Anyway, I thought I would, <laughs> I would need to continue for a little bit, <laughs> but we now have Cruz with us, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him, let him speak. But perhaps Catalina, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna take the, the mic again, and before that. Yeah, great. Thanks Cruz. a lot, Leopold, for that overview, and welcome, Cruz. Thank you for making it. <laughs> I know um, you are. Sorry. No, no, go. No, no worries. We it's... we all know you have an excellent excuse. <laughs> It's uh, also that uh, somehow the schedule was something changed. Oh, sorry, something changed with the with the time zone or something at some point, and then they they had it one hour longer. So, and there's a four day old here somewhere. Um, but really happy to be joining. Um, so maybe I can introduce you briefly, uh, and then we can move uh, to the presentation. Uh, so, and, and we have extra support as, as I see next to you. <laughs> so that's even better. <laughs> we are all up for intergenerational encounters. <laughs> so uh, we're very happy to, to have here um, uh, Cruz Garcia uh, and by extension also Natalie <laughs> that will be around. <laughs> yes. So today um, uh, we, are gonna be listening from Cruz Garcia and Natalie Frankowski. They are co-directors of Y Architecture Think Tank. This is a planetary studio practicing by questioning the political, historical and material legacy and imperatives of architecture and urbanism founded in Brussels during the financial crisis of 2008 by Puerto Rican architect, artist, curator, educator, author and theorist Cruz Garcia and French architect, artist, curator, educator, author and poet Natalie Frankowski why is one of the several, there are several platforms of public engagement. Uh, they are now associate professors at Iowa State University and are of very prolific authors of books such as Narrative Architecture, The Clinical Manifesto, Pure Hardcore Icons, A Manifesto of Pure Form in Architecture, A Manual for Anti-Racist Architecture Education, and the upcoming book From Black Square to Black Reason, A Postcolonial Architecture Manifesto. Today, they will be presenting to us a very exciting, interesting project um, called Loud Reading Guides to the Postcolonial Method. So, without further ado, uh, I leave it, I hand over to you, Chris. Oh, 
sorry. Uh, now I know what it really is to have a loud reader at home. So uh, I'm sharing the screen. I'm sorry. You see? Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm starting. Thanks a lot for the invitation, and we're really happy also to be here together with Leopold. And this has been like our first slide in, recently in our presentations because it allowed us to frame some of the questions we've been asking ourselves about uh, how do we talk about history, how do we talk about legacy, how do we talk about all the all the you know, really pressing issues of our time uh, and, 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 you know, working with a funambulist for that, uh, like, kind of spontaneous collaboration allowed us to, 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 to reframe many of the things that we've been think, uh, thinking about. Uh, and, and those things involve many of the things that have been happening all around the world. Uh, we call it the, the, the era of the planetary wretched, uh, where, you know, building from that uh, Fanon book of the, of the wretched of the earth, uh, we can start to understand what, what is the, the, the real colonial footprint uh, of, of, of white supremacy, of uh, settler colonialism, and how these uh, struggles that have always been universal, now they are in a way undeniable because of uh, the, the sort of visibility that, that social media and, and, and many forms of, of, of media give us today. And then for us, it's really important to understand what is the relationship of architecture to all these systems of extraction and oppression, uh, um, right? Uh, when we see like the neoliberal manifesto of Jesse Moore some years ago, it's not surprising to find pictures of Bjarke Ingels uh, with Jair Bolsonaro that is a racist, anti-indigenous uh, 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 politician, um, basically saying why are indigenous people over our resources basically, right? Like let's, let's, let's get rid of them so we can keep on developing and modernizing in a way, uh, um, understanding um, how um, architects are not only participating involuntarily, but they're active enhancers of, of, of these systems of, of, of extraction and, 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 and segregation and environmental spoliation. And also they pretend that we don't know history in a way, right? When they propose to, uh, to make the design earth to stop climate change, right? From the same people that brought us settler colonialism and shadow slavery, uh, or somebody that wants to cover the entire planet with an inhabitable biostructure. Like, isn't that what earth is anyways, right? So it, it is like a, this stupidity where, where architecture and media keeps repeating uh, sort of the completely nonsense that designers are always spouting, right? For, for attention. Um, understanding that even when Elon Musk makes a joke saying that we will coup whoever we want when confronted with the coup of Bolivia, it is not really a joke when, the, when it's coming from above, really. Um, uh, that we have to understand that these systems of extraction uh, are not uh, something that is foreign to us. So to give you a bit of background of who we are, we founded our studio in 2008 uh, in the middle of the financial crisis in Wall Street and then we live in many places around the world. Uh, we met in, uh, in Brussels, live in Beijing for seven years, uh, where we kind of uh, live in a city of uh, 20 million people, and then woke up the next day in the middle of the imaginary of the American architect, right? Like we, we were teaching and living in the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, and this put us in a really strange odd with this land, uh, landscapes of set settler colonialism, but also with the imaginaries of the architect as the genius white guy that is going to save us, right? That is going to sort of uh, redesign the earth or, 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 or bring architecture as a, as a form of like a single author solution to everything, right? So being there allows us to question that legacy, engage with students from different ages and propose different forms of, of, um, of, of thinking about architecture. Uh, so we always been at odds with institutions in a way. These are 
documentary that we are part of that we didn't know the title, but you can see, right, like Frank Ray Wright, the man who built America, which is such a fall fallacious and, and misleading uh, title to, to, to write something. Uh, um, and, and for us, you know, like finishing school in 2008, it was really easy to see the relationship with, the, with, the, with 1968, in the 40th anniversary, uh, right, with the streets of Paris, with the civil rights movement, with Stonewall, right, with the, uh, um, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson for, for gay and queer rights, uh, um, and understanding how these struggles haven't stopped really, if we think about it, right? Like it's not really um, different to see the streets of Paris today than it was uh, 40 years ago, right? Like we kind of arguing for some of the same things uh, all along. It's not shocking to find the relationship between Baltimore in 68 and Baltimore last year, right? Uh, so, so in a way, as, as time evolves, history keeps being that sort of cyclical manifestation where uh, uh, for us, it's also really important to understand who is at the center of these struggles, right? The role that uh, indigenous, black, uh, women, uh, trans people, right? Like play in, in, this, uh, in the systems of resistance in the struggle has been really fundamental as we shift uh, uh, our points of references as, as we question the epistemologies that we have been trained into in a way, right? Understanding how lucky we are that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a digital screen and not behind bulletproof glass, right? Because that's the state of, 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 uh, of radical activism uh, around the world, particularly here in the United States where as we speak in the state where I am, uh, words like equality and like, uh, uh, colonialism and, and white supremacy are, are illegal in a way, right? So there are some politicians actively trying to, to, uh, to, uh, to persecute any form of questioning of the status quo, uh, therefore the questioning of the state, America, right? Understanding, you know, what are, what are these relationships and how can we start learning from tools and, and strategies that, that are the ones that are used to build history to question that? I love this uh, map by Hank Willis Thomas, where he takes Alfred Barr, uh, all the movements, right? And he inserts all the colonial expeditions that allow those movements to exist in the first place. Uh, understanding that those systems of extraction, they're still happening, even if don't, they don't happen in front of us, right? Like we're in a globalized uh, economy. Uh, so, some, somewhere, some, somehow, somebody is getting affected by our consumption, our, our connections to capitalism. Understanding, you know, when I look at this painting by Turner of the slave ship, right? Like when uh, when people are being thrown overboard uh, for, in order for the slave owners to claim the insurance, something that actually happened many times. Uh, what is problematic about this painting is not only the content of the painting, but the fact that the family that owned the painting sold it to a mu the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and with the money of the painting, they they bought a sugar plantation and mill in Puerto Rico, right? So. Uh, what is also important to understand is not only the content of the images and the production, but uh, rather the economy is also that fuel many of these systems. Uh, so I come from the world oldest colony. Puerto Rico was invaded by, by Columbus on 1493, has been a colony ever since, uh, more than 500 years of being a colony, right? So it's, uh, what we propose as the post-colonial imagination is an imagination not of what happens in the world after, after, after colonialism, but rather what happens with the regimes of brutality, extraction, and oppression that are so typical in the colonies in the Caribbean become the norm everywhere else, right? So it's not shocking to see the similarities between thousands of people uh, dying, basically unnamed in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and seeing the millions that are dying today of COVID, right, in a sort of necropolitical system that kind of wipes uh, asymmetrically, but also that expands all over the world in the same way that hurricanes are going uh, higher and lower in latitude every time because the globe is getting warmer, we can also say that the plantation is expanding somehow right, other than disappearing. Um, uh, for us, it's also really important, as, as I mentioned, to find where are those manifestos that challenge this. This is the, the spokesperson of the collective feminist in construction in Puerto Rico and the t-shirt reads at the patriarchal feminist, lesbian, trans, Caribbean, Latin American, right? Uh, understanding the role that queer activists, that trans activists, that black, indigenous activists have played in many of these uh, struggles of emancipation, of, of dignity to access to life, in the colonization of the land, uh, uh, and, and understanding how architecture tends to be in the other side of the fight, right? Uh, aligning with the supremacist power, uh, with hegemonic power, 
and uh, using double think, you know, when they justify making the design of prisons in the United States as places that facilitate the humane treatment and rehabilitation of inmates, you know, is that exponentially incarcerates racialized people uh, and is the, the larger um, uh, carceral state in the world, and also military. Uh, understanding what are those architectures of separation and the effects on the environment, uh, but also what are the truly democratic forms of architecture when people come together to bring down monuments that were never democratically erected. So that's also something that is really uh, stimulating for us that leads us to the idea of the loud readers, right? As we question the legacy of settler colonialism and the construction of these landscapes of indigenous erasure and displacement where there are almost like postcards that were created right in the 1800s to invite settlers to conquer these lands and develop them to agriculture and technology and architecture and urbanism. Uh, we are really interested in bringing back the ideology behind these images by reinserting militarized architectures in them. So the process of installations and collages, uh, we have been working on a series of projects that reinsert uh, the architectures there, also that question the legacy of the modern institutions uh, that sort of shape our ideas about segregation of, of gender and race in, in, in design uh, and propose other forms, rather, you know, why the Bauhaus when we can look at other, other systems of education, right? Like we can talk about Johannes Eaton, right? And the white Bauhaus and how racist and, 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 and sexist all this was. Uh, but instead, what we propose is to learn from other schools, uh, much more radical, you know, like the uh, BTEPS uh, people art school where men and women and children and men were working together in a small Jewish town in Belarus, or the practice of, uh, of, of loud reading in the tobacco factories where workers who were denied any means of formal education in Puerto Rico would pick one of their own that knew how to read to read for them during the entire workday. As the loud readers, started reading, you know, mostly men at the beginning, reading, you know, classics like Victor Hugo, Dostoevsky, Flaubert, uh, people like Luisa Capetillo, uh, anarcho-syndico feminist utopian writer, um, reading much more political text, created some of the ma uh, biggest and most powerful strikes of workers in the island, right? So we want to, uh, we're really interested in resurrecting that practice of the loud reader of tobacco factory, and combining it with the with, with the, the collective novice of our champions of new art in BTS, we we came up with this sort of idea of an anti Bauhaus or uh, something that is like a, another form of, uh, of radical education called post novice or of uh, post colonial novice, and it's a collective we started through to installations and exhibitions, and that later on, sorry, yeah, some of the first installations we made. Uh, and later on evolve into a, a series of talks and conversation, manifesto readings, the construction of sort of syllabi and curriculums. Uh, and most recently, uh, you know, even the lectures we will do in person will turn into installations, like sort of recruitment propaganda uh, program uh, for, for, for post novice, uh, a series of plays that we have been doing, like a, a, a screenplays where we are finding ways to collaborate with uh, our collaborators from all around the world. Um, this one was in the in Virginia um, with writers and artists and, and filmmakers. And as part of this project, you know, also collaborating with many students from all around the world in, in the construction of these sort of uh, postcolonial murals and publications, also with many amazing artists. And most recently, um, something that Leopold has been a part of too, uh, uh, and we will be thankful for that uh, several times already. Um, uh, in March 2020, we created this platform uh, in response of the further alienation brought in by COVID-19, where we can hijack the, the sort of software paid by the institutions and, and make a free online architecture school based on the tobacco loud readers, right? And we created loudreaders.com, where we invite uh, thinkers, uh, philosophers, theorists, activists uh, to loud read for us. Uh, and present their either do workshops or do uh, 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 readings of critical texts or talk about their practice. Uh, and it's a platform that is always available and accessible freely online. We run also an experimental trade school for 10 days in the summer of 2020. And all the workshops are online, so everybody can do them at any moment. So it's like a free, accessible content. Uh, um, and then sometimes we use also the institutions that will 
sort of um, um, commission us to 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 uh, to do a symposium or something, and we turn it into a loud reader session to write. This allowed us to create a completely alternative uh, sort of reading list and a sort of a theoretical uh, uh, compass, uh, and also allowed us to develop other forms of, of manifestation across different languages, like in Spanish or actual real activism, loud reading in the streets during the protests in Pittsburgh, uh, or collaborating with uh, activists that are not from architecture, like people that are really in the streets, right? Like working uh, through art and, 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 and you know, teaching and so on, uh, and using our teaching platforms to keep on expanding those ideas about loud reading. We run this series called Activism as Practice in a, in a class we teach about professional practice in uh, in Virginia Tech and also became a publishing platform, right? Where we could publish on making architectural anti-racist architecture manifesto in the summer of 2020 and later on a manual of anti-racist architecture education that became a real important source for many people around the world. I think it got downloaded around 20,000 times the first two weeks that we, when we published it and then we made a Spanish translation. I know that it appears in many people's syllabi and it shows that there was a lack for such a document, like it didn't exist really, if you think about it, like especially in our circles, there was not a, a document to refer to when we were thinking about education. Uh, and, and what the document does is that is bringing some of the questions that we are fighting with today uh, here, you know, in Iowa and in many places in the United States, but all around the world, were um, how can we deconstruct something that was basically built on rotten roots, right? Is it Right, and that's the question that we're asking ourselves, uh, and and we're trying to find every opportunity to fight with. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw the the meltdown of uh, Sarah Apollo. Quite ridiculous, but also it's quite symptomatic. He said it and made it public because he has no shame, of course. But many people think like him, right? Like they think that the, the university is this like a liberal place where they are pushing a liberal. Uh, 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 an anti-racist agenda when in reality we can argue that it's the complete opposite right like where we are a small minority that is kind of fighting on the fringes uh, so the publication kind of brings some of those ideas and reworks some of the tools that have been historically assembled and question them by recentering systems of oppression and anti-blackness all around the world including the anti-racist anti-racist spiral of uh, architectural education where you can intersect all the forms knowledge for media theory, uh, uh, history, and technology, right? Uh, addressing things like the tuition fees and the, and the endowments of many American universities built upon uh, slave labor and stolen land. And I think like, I'll leave it there because it's 16 minutes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's perfectly fine. We, we are full, we're fine with time. I think it's been great to see, actually, I think even it helped the, the sequence of presentations. So I'm very glad that in a way that diagram that you both showed it epitomizes a real kind of reframing and trying to uh, bring to our faces how are this, the complicit nature uh, of design with the production of the world as we know it. And that's why imagining worlds otherwise is essential. Uh, and particularly for us as educators is uh, a must. And that's why pedagogy uh, and how we take uh, this different understanding is absolutely essential. Like, so few cross-cutting elements uh, in your talks. And now we're gonna give uh, a space also for Q and A. And so people please feel free to, to raise your hand if you want, so you can be promoted as panelists so we can have like a, an informal conversation uh, learning from uh, these two presentations. I think it's been very interesting to see the use of cartographies and manifestos as part, an essential part uh, of design practice, but also the role that is playing these different um, settings of media and how digital forms, but also editorial practices are becoming part of the repertoire of urban design. And I think that is something that we are learning from and trying to use as well uh, in our pedagogical approaches. I think there, there are still many questions for us in terms of what does it mean reparations in the context of design? 
what does it mean, the colonizing, or shall we talk about anti-colonialism, as Silvia Rivera Kosikansky <laughs> suggests us, and not to get trapped uh, also in the in the quotation that is practiced, is still practiced nowadays with this term, but also how not to lose the, the great legacy that the Latin American school of modernity, the col coloniality is also offering us to, to think differently urban design. I think the other element that I, uh, I think was very prominent in, in your talk, and it's giving the, the title to our talk, is what is what is the role for designers to be part of a broader political struggle and how to align with activist practices? So I think those could be some of the questions of how can we think from a design perspective, the role of activism, and also how can we, what can design offer to activism itself? And I think that is something that we can uh, discuss farther. So I think th those were some of the, of the key uh, elements that, that were part of, the, of this discussion. And of course, the backdrop uh, of the big anti-colonial struggles and how we make a, a productive use of this reframing in, in our practice. So I think we have uh, already someone uh, already raising uh, a hand. I don't know if Azade Sobut would like to be promoted as panelist of if you want to drop um, your question in the box. Either, either way works. If anyone is happy to be promoted as panelists, you can just say out loud your comment or your question to, to have uh, a more interactive uh, moment. Ah, I think she disappeared. <laughs> I think we lost her. Oh no, she's there. Anyone would like to uh, make any comment? Or perhaps we can start just a quick round, maybe a little bit of a reaction in terms of um, this discussion um, around anti-colonial struggles and how can we be more creative in developing uh, methodologies from the design perspective um, is something that we are kind of grappling with. Uh, and I was wondering what is the role of um, the urban in your work? Because a lot of the a lot of times is very this discussion is happening either in the context of design in general, of architecture in particular. But I think what is the role of the urban in your understanding of these processes and also how you are uh, using the notion of the urban uh, in, your, in your projects. So we can do an interface also with the understanding from urban design. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if the word is urban, and I, I, will, I will tell you why, because I live in the non-urban part of the United States where empty landscapes, yeah, and that, that for us is really important. Those paintings mm -hmm. are really important because we think of a settler colonialism as an urban condition, right? Like you make a city like New York, you know, the Dutch or, or and so on and so forth, but the plantations were not cities. And the blueprint of the plantation needs extraction, mostly. So colonialism exists because, particularly because there's delicious things being grown somewhere else, right? Like food in Europe suck. So they needed something that tastes good to make money, right? So sugar, tobacco, chocolate, right? Like all the things that are delicious, right? Spices. Um, so I would say that it's not necessarily an urban question. It's a, it's a question of the land. And just to give you an example, like we were teaching, we, we had the opportunity to reframe the theory course that, that is taught here in Iowa State. Uh, and it's like, how do you think, like people are like being thinking about how they reframe theory and, you know, like how do you read Foucault today or how do you read uh, Habermas or, you know, how can we, we include Fanon? And we were like, not even the order of the things we're talking about, it was weird. We are in a land grant university. So we are gonna start, start by talking about the land. What does it mean to have a land grant? What does it mean to have violent dispossession of indigenous people and create agriculture universities, right? Uh, and what is the, what are the effects of that in the imagination, right? Like the, the, what is the blueprint of the plantation, right? Like the, the questions about Black Lives Matter of the police and all that, that's all related to plantation economy, right? To like a land, land ownership, 
uh, in the Americas uh, to racialization of bodies, right? That comes out of this uh, compartmentalization of the land and the, and, and the separation between the custodians or the owners and the workers, right? That are forced labor, um, but they're also property too, right? So they're objects. Uh, and then the cities come into play. So there's an urban question, but I would say it's not, it's not an urban problem. It may manifest itself through urbanism, and we can see it in the cities, right, as they're militarized. But I don't think that just by looking at the urban question, we will address the actual issue. I think the issue, if we're really talking about anti-colonialism, we have to talk about the land. And what does it mean, right? Like, what does it mean to occupy? What does it mean to displace? What does it mean to erase? What does it mean to compartmentalize? What does it mean to think of property, right? Uh, to think of extraction of resources, of energy, all these questions, you know, like the Green New Deal and all that. It's like, where are you even taking the stuff that you're gonna like uh, power your energy with? Like, are we even talking about this or is it just like a capitalist conversation that perpetuates at infinitum? So I would say we need to like look at the question in a, in a slightly larger sense, because even if we think of it in the urban sense, you know, you being in London, for example, um, uh, where, where, where is the, what is the colonial footprint of London in the sense of land all around the world, right? Uh, how on London as we know it is only possible because of land that has been occupied everywhere else, right? And the economies that have fueled London are economies of extraction and, 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 and sort of uh, predation and capture. So yeah, like, I think like that's something that Leopold does great in the, in the, in the magazine. It's like, we look at those questions beyond even being based in Paris, beyond like the sort of uh, the, the European understanding of, 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 of place, right? Of, 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 of cities and so on. I feel, because uh, it is, uh, as Achille Bembe says, and many other people say, it's a planetary question, right? And by planetary is not only in scale, but a question of the planet, right? Of fissuring, of extracting, of spilling of organic matter uh, and, and sort of the spoliation of the earth and so on, right? So, how, how, how can we understand it as, as that complexity? Like uh, also we were having that really nice uh, presentation with uh, Arturo Escobar when he, he talks about the pretty bird soul, right? Uh, and there's all, how all these things are sort of connected to cosmologies and so on. I think like somewhere along those lines, right? Uh, he talked also about um, how to re-earth the cities. And that, I, I found that really interesting in the sense that this, the, in, it, it, going back to the question of the urban before I, I pass the, the baton to, to, to Leopold, is that oftentimes we think of the city as this thing that has been the earth, where the earth and the land has been taken away and the city is kind of separated. But we cannot think of it like that. There's no cities without the land that where they are, but also the land that is uh, kind of fuels them, right? Like the energy, the, the economy, the, the the resources and so and the people right like they are connected to those lands so, yeah yeah so maybe leopold can follow up yeah <clears throat> and first of all let me, let me say that I, I was in the same situation than cruz four months ago and i would i would have been absolutely unable to give a talk after four days of a child being born so <laughs> you amaze me cruz um and and I, I i could not agree more i mean i i am absolutely and and actually it's it's pretty fascinating because what you were describing about the land is our march april 2022 issue so <laughs> So you and I will talk. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, but yeah, I think I think the the word the word that I would use to describe what you were describing is the word of continuum, and the idea that when we start talking about the urban, it, it really doesn't make that much sense to me because I mean I, I recognize there is a discipline called called urbanism or urban studies or urban design or whatever. But I am, um, and that, that's also answering a little bit the question that was the first question that was asked in the Q and A, which is what discipline to look at, and the answer is all and none at the same time. I think like it's um, uh, because you know a city does not exist as such except as like one sort of concentration of things uh, as part of a continuum, and indeed exactly like Cruz said, like 
what is occupation of a land? Uh, uh, it's it, also when we think of time, it's like we we are as body always occupy a certain a certain land at any given moment of the time. But architecture manages to create a different scale of time of occupation that is a very much the scale of settler colonialism itself, which in itself is not also you know we should not forget is is not like the alpha and omega of time either. Like the colonialism used to not exist and we will we will defeat it at some point as well and uh, and making it like the everything of everything is also a little bit problematic and i mean you know i'm saying that for people who have the luxury of like thinking of it uh, intellectually and all that and not people who are experiencing it on a daily basis but but like when we when we have this luxury i think it's very important to also make it something uh, what I what I sometimes call the the colonial parenthesis and how this is only one small part of entire nation's histories uh, quite often, uh, and so architecture is fundamentally complicit with that. So uh, I also I also see a question saying like what what are the anti-racist architectures that you would like to promote, and my sort of provocative answer would be like none, <laughs> uh, meaning me, meaning if if there are anti-racist spaces in the world, it's not thanks to architecture, or at least it's definitely not thanks to architects, uh, and and it's much more about the way an architecture is appropriated and and uh, and sometimes in a not so sometimes in a very deliberate way, sometimes in a more organic way. And, uh, and, and I, like in the anti-colonial anti architectures I'm thinking of are, you know, the examples I often use is, is Algier, Algiers old city, the Casbah, uh, which because of its morphology, because of the way its inhabitants were inhabited, inhabitating, <laughs> sorry, it, uh, uh, somehow, and 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 the way the way uh, the the Algerian National Liberation Front managed to also organize from there, like a few a few guerrilleros essentially managed to manage to almost defeat like the third back then the third biggest uh, uh, army in the world, so uh, namely the colonial French army, and so and so you know. No, no architects like design the Algiers Casbah thinking like, okay, I'm going to design something that's going to, that's going to be good, like it's going to, it's going to be revolutionary or anything like that. I think we should, we should, we should drop this. Although, and and th that also to go back to the first question, what what sh what should we? No, th th sorry, that was your question, Catalina. Like what, what it, where is the space for the designer in all those processes and all that? And honestly, I feel like every time we talk about this in an abstract way, we it leads nowhere because we don't. When we use words like when I use the word violence, for example, then it's it's mis, mis it's misunderstood by by many people because I don't mean it necessarily as a as a bad thing, for example. Uh, and um, and so when it remains in the abstract, I feel that I'd rather say that there is no no architecture that can uh, sort of act. Uh, in a in an anti-colonial uh, program, when actually when when it is much more specific to uh, a certain context and uh, and including the the political organizing from which it emerged, then of course it's a little bit more complicated than that, and and that's good because that that's in the complicated that perhaps there's a little bit of agency that uh, that we're able to use. Yeah, and I think your your uh, responses somehow talk to this argument about having a closer look to the connection of personhood of property and rather learning from the Latin American school of uh, understanding territories and cuerpo territory or bodies territory in the engagement with the production of the planetary. And I think that perspective for me could be one of the productive way of understanding this multi-scalar view, if you will. I think we have some other questions in the chat that perhaps is interesting to I wanted to I, uh, I wanted I wanted to address the anti-racist because I as I disagree with Leopold, <laughs> and and maybe that's the designer in me, um, and but also because I don't think of architecture as something that only architects trained in architecture school do, uh, and also I don't think of it like so. Uh, my confession is I'm a formalist, and I don't think that formalism is a something of architects, right? Like I feel like we are formalists as humans. And there are forms of resistance too. And I feel like because there are forms of resistance, there is a possibility of architecture that is anti-colonial. Um, and it exists and we can see many examples of them. 
and, and I also believe that even these people can still be in architecture school too, because architecture school can change too. Like if we think that architecture is not that thing that we are only looking at Valerio Giatti and, uh, and uh, European architects talking about non-referential architecture, for example, right? Or I believe there's other forms of architecture. Otherwise I wouldn't do none of what we're doing, right? So it comes from out of like a sheer optimism uh, or naivete. I, mean, I don't think I'm, not, I'm that naive to be honest with you, maybe more cynical or clinical or whatever. And then also, and it relates to another question that was written there, is that um, there is a, an idea of, 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 um, of bringing an expansion of the field and a dismantling of the field as we know, in a way. So there's two things that are happening simultaneously or we wish that are happening simultaneously where we are constantly redefining. I don't even know if architecture, architect is the word anymore. Like as Leslie Loco wrote that beautiful like a space magicians that I love a lot because I, I remember going to architecture school in Puerto Rico and they somebody defining architecture as architect and techne and then they do stupid two combination of words. They try to define what architecture is just because of some Greek origin. And I find it so in a way idiotic because I don't speak Greek. So why would I care? But also because there's so many different languages that architect architect doesn't mean architect, right? Uh, space magicians was one of them. In Chinese is another thing, right? Like, so there are many ways to describe this practice of engaging with the built and destroyed environment. Therefore, yes, it can exist. It does exist. Uh, it may look familiar. It may look really unfamiliar, I would say. Like, so it, I, I don't think there's a set of instructions, right? It will be, it will be part of every circumstances and every context in a way but but i, I would say like yeah uh, maybe like at least more with me in that Absol way. absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and perhaps given that there's probably a bunch of students in the audience i should i should i should add that you know i mean natalie cruz and i are more or less from the same generation of of people who, who finished school and like in the mid 2000s let's say and um and you know it was a bit rough back then and then now we're seeing more and more like actually incredible, uh, very, very young professors such as, well, Natalie and Cruz <laughs> in, within the architecture field. So I, I would also not like, I would not quit architecture school just by the way after. <laughs> no, no, because I understand that sometimes my arguments tend to be a little bit paralyzing, but, but also, you know, I think less and less so because people, people, people understand exactly what you just said, Chris. We have many interesting questions in the chat. Uh, so no one, everyone I think is shy to be promoted as panelists. So maybe I will read some of them and maybe I read them and maybe we have a general reaction and comments if you will. So Vishnu Prasad says, cities and urban spaces are marked by colonial spaces of segregation, confinement, replicating the logic of plantation, the penal colony. How do we move towards decolonizing the idea of property as ownership as an exclusive right to exclude, which seems central to the question of land urban cities today? What radical movements do you take a specific inspiration from? And there's another one that I think is very connected from Nicolette uh, that says, there, there are such important conversations to have, but I feel the spaces are very particular and limited that enable and allow for these conversations to happen. So much of higher education and academia is still dominated by the colonial narratives I did, and they root so deeply that many don't even question at all or ex exercise critical thinking. Also in urban planning, design, governance and municipalities, policy making, leadership, these problems are very present. It is a systemic issue. What are the possible pathways to deconstruct change the mainstream narrative have impact, influence or sometimes even a voice at all, I wonder. Have, perhaps have more spaces where these conversations can happen in my academic experience. I have felt quite a number of times that it's not okay to question many of the very important notions and be critical. Uh, there's also Arubana says, uh, getting back to Catalina's questions, what is the connection or the connect with design practice? Um, Andy Edwards says, I frequently work with meanwhile spaces, temporary occupation of empty and underused building spaces and places as catalysts for rapid prototyping of alternative future uses connections. 
in your view, is the theme of meanwhile a useful lens through which to consider the theory practice of the colonizing architecture? Well, I think there are many lines of inquiry there, but maybe we can take your reactions to some of those questions. Perhaps. I think that there was there was a one and I don't know if you mentioned it, but there was one that talked about like where do we look for sources like uh, architecture, and urbanism, or something like that. And I was thinking that you need to architecture is not a bubble, and that's something that many architecture schools are terrible at addressing. So you need to look out, and many universities have amazing scholars and thinkers that are not in architecture, uh, and I think that that's the most for us, it's fundamental to collaborate with people that are not architects. Even if some architects we do admire and have amazing work, they do the same, actually. They are always looking out. I wouldn't say out because it's still inside architecture, because this architecture is everywhere. It's always dealing with everything else. So architecture doesn't really exist in that isolated role. Uh, and I think that also relates to some of the questions of the designer and stuff like that. So all these ideas are, we need to redefine all the time what they are. And that will be also, fitting to everybody in particular, right? Like who you are, what is your goal? What is your struggle? I feel like that's the ultimate question, right? Because uh, even if anti-colonialism is a really important issue, it's not the only one, right? Uh, there is a uh, questions of capital. There are questions that deal with race and with gender and with, uh, and they intersect, but they're not necessarily exclusive. Uh, and they exist also beyond like, and this is an argument I have with many other uh, friends too, where you may have a, you know, anti anti capitalist heteropatriarchy, right? So how do we deal with that? And how do we deal with uh, how many of these struggles have been co opted also by some forms of power? Um, so it's it's in in a way like the question of the designer is the question of the of the critical thinkers. Like how do we are are we constantly redefining who we are? and really being aware of the struggles, not only the ones that are visible, but the ones that are kind of invisible and are really, really running under the radar. I think that that's really fundamental. And in order for us, if, if we can call ourselves a discipline, in order to do that, we need to open up. If we only have like middle class, uh, educated, right? Traditionally educated people having access to architecture school, we're going nowhere because it doesn't matter how open minded we are and how sensible we are. We have so many blind spots because of our own personal experiences and our own like cultural context. So I feel like unless architecture school can also revolutionize um, its accessibility in the sense of the reach of people, uh, those things are not going to be possible. So that's why we cannot only look at content. We have to look at practice, but not practice only of making buildings, but also practice of education, practice of, 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 of accessibility. All these, all these things are really close one to the other, right? So if we are all reading beautiful poetry by Glissant, right? And all of us are like middle class, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, people from um, countries with, uh, with, uh, imperial power, right, and, 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 and military power, uh, are, are we really like, you know, practicing what we are reading in a way? So how can we also take into consideration, you know, those, those other factors that may not be necessarily content related, but more like practice related? Thank and perhaps, you, perhaps I, Leopold. Yeah, no, sorry, Catalina, but I was actually going to refer to something you mentioned in the very, very, for, uh, in the very, very introduction, which is also being very wary of, of the sort of, um, you know, the idea to decolonize, for example, like there's this verb that is being used to, uh, in every, in every possible way to that, to a point that it means almost nothing anymore. I mean, that's not true because there's still like, like there's still, uh, um, there are still things that we can call decol decolonizing, and and they exist, and we should really uh, uh, we should really pay attention to them. But it's it's the the way the way we there is indeed like I mean, you know Cruz, Cruz talk about Glissant and like how we how we might be able like to to create spaces indeed where the conversation is to be had as as one of the question uh, mentioned. But if if this conversation does not really lead to a profound uh, uh, 
dismantling of the way uh, this, the way architects continue to build the structures of white supremacy and settler colonialism and and and, and misogyny and 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 ableism and many many of those and capitalism of course and many of those uh, system of of oppression then we're we're not really doing anything and um and uh and i think that's also why i'm a little bit uncompromising with what architecture does because uh i also um i do, i i, I I'm I'm all I'm all for the tactical optimism that uh, Cruz was was mentioning, but indeed I think naivete is also some is something that as architect we just cannot fall into because we can be naive being uh, I don't know being a baker maybe but but uh, but uh, like architects have too much power to be to be uh, to be naive. And I think where was I going with that? Yeah, no, but I think that's also why so this this sort of like, uncompromising vision of architecture consists also in saying that there are there are no architecture that we enter and as person within an architecture we become free like there is no sort of eman emancipatory effect of architecture on people on the other hand there is an absolutely carceral uh, effect of architecture on 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 people like there are buildings where you enter and you're no longer free it's called prisons it's called camps it's called cell it's called many things. So, so I think at police stations, there we 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 cannot we cannot afford uh, the belief that architecture is this very neutral thing that can either serve the serves the serves the those systems we want to dismantle, or actually serve our our system if if we if we just think about it a little bit. Like I think I think it needs really life lifelong engagement with it the, the way Cruz and Natalie are are doing to really find like some thing within design that that allows us to to really serve an, an anti-racist or anti-colonial uh, agenda yeah that that's that's very interesting in our program we talk about the undisciplined nature of urban design and trying to break completely the notion of the discipline in itself uh, because as as we know the enlightenment tradition is is born out of this idea that you have a specialized focus like ideas or set of knowledges uh, an authoritative knowledge that you know resides in certain places, and therefore the whole idea of the university in itself is is a, a creation from that logic. Uh, and somehow I mean, we the, have to be aware of it. The association of those two words, urban design, is terrifying. I feel. Like. <laughs> but that's why we're thinking it otherwise. I, I would like to just give another round of questions, if you will, maybe to conclude. I don't know if Cruz want to, to complement something there. No, I was saying because we, I, I always introduce ourselves also as, uh, as urbanists too. <laughs> so we had all the <laughs> titles. Uh, also, think tank is a, is a traditionally conservative uh, sort of uh, thing working for, for hegemonic powers too. So it's all the names. How can you kind of play with them in a way? Yeah, but speaking of that, and I think that is essential, I think there's a very nice question from Adrian Marty that says, well, welcome, Emma. Thank you for today's important conversation. What role can joy have in anti-colonial design? Thank you for your incredible work. And Anonymous attendee says, what is the role of restitution in the embodiment of your work? And I think both those two questions are intertwined. So perhaps we can have a, a, a final round uh, about those responses to those questions. Could you repeat the first one? Because I, I forgot already. The role of joy. The role of the joy. Role of jo ah, like happiness. Well, I, well, let let me go first, Cruz, because I'm sure I'm sure you're gonna have a wonderful way to conclude this conversation. So I would like I would like you to go last, and in that case, <laughs> but but a joy a joy is actually something. It's much more than happiness. Much much more than happiness. Joy is a, is a concept that I I highly uh, value in my sort of system of values, and and it comes from like some some pretty old reading of mine that but that I've. I think quite quite fundamentally uh, affected the way um, the way I perceive the physical reality, which is which is going through the philosophy of Spinoza, and and how even when I speak about violence, even though that's not a word he, he uses, like that's that's I also think of think of it in a Spinozist way, meaning like in a way that uh, where uh, the physical reality that's around us is 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 hurting us in some way, like it decreases our 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 pot 
potential, like our potenza in Latin. I mean, anyway, that, that was back in the days when I was still reading philosophy, but but Spinoza had like a really great impact on, uh, on me. And I, I did I did write like two texts called Architecture of Joyce that was uh, very much analyzing uh, the, the architecture of, uh, of my two mentors, Arakawa and Madeleine Gaines, as being like truly revolutionary architecture. So you see, like I, I do manage to find some sometimes when I try hard. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the thinking about it was, was that uh, joy in, in a sort of Spinoza's philosophy is what, on the contrary of violence, is what um, sort of increased our, our our potential. I mean, potential is not a great translation, but you you you'll 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 know what I mean probably. Um, and um, and I think that the architecture of Arakawa and Gins are very much trying to do that, like the way they engage with the body and and they engage the body in a very anti-normative way. Like they don't assume what a body is supposed to be for their like their architecture does not assume does not um, does not have a clear idea of what a body is. I think I think this way the way the way the body has to compose its parts to speak again like in a in a very Spinozist manner as uh, a way like Deleuze talking about Spinoza would say the way you would surf a wave like the way you would try to compose your body in in adequation with a sort of very a very strong life force that is that is the wave like uh, like that's where something quite interesting happens. And as much as much as it is not such a political thing when you look at it in, a, in an abstract way, when you when you deal with it within a given political context, and it can it can highly become political, uh, perhaps starting with systems of anti-ableism or or feminism or or many many sort of queer uh, uh, approach to the way bodies is constructed. But even even more than that, I think so. I think joy is joy is truly a great concept to bring in the conversation, and perhaps just to address in in ten seconds the questions on property, I think perhaps one of the word we want to replace property with is the concept of stewardship, uh, which which could be interesting in inspiration to the land. But basically, if you if you need to put barbed wire to <laughs> to delineate your what you consider properties, then there's already there's already a problem. Custodianship, yeah, beautiful, yeah. Anyway, Cruz, the floor is all yours to finish it. <laughs> you can slam dunk. Yeah, I think like the, the question of joy, it's something that has been addressed by so many people. Uh, joy is something, it's revolutionary, right? So, and, and I, I think like maybe against Spinoza, I would say you can have joy in smashing racist sculptures. So there's a lot of joy in, in anti-colonial violence. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that they're like the opposite, but rather it, joy is something that is personal, but also could be collective. And I think like in collective joy is where true emancipation lies when you are using your tools and your strategies and your methods and your energy to col for collective emancipation, the only emancipation possible. I, I think that that's where that's where all the all these struggles connect, uh, and that's what connects Angela Davis to Palestina, to uh, to Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, to Aymara people, to you know it, it is such a it's such a human goal, right? To be emancipated, to be you know to have access to 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 dignified life, uh, and. And, and here is where design becomes really powerful, I think. And architecture maybe, and, and whatever we do, whatever tools we have available is that maybe it's not the design of objects that we are looking for, but, but the design of ways in which we can reappropriate, re-instrumentalize, re and implement ways to go through the revolution joyfully, right? I feel like, and it's not so much about the end because the end is almost never in sight, but finding ways where we can find ways where the revolution becomes the joy, where what we're making is stimulating, beautiful, or radical, critical, 
raises many questions, right? And I feel like as designers, I feel like that's the least we could try to do is find joy in the revolution. And yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great closure. I think we still had a few more questions, but I'm very mindful of time. I think we're running a little bit over. Uh, and maybe those are pending questions for this space uh, also to be returning to. Uh, questions about uh, tradition, if the traditional and urban design and architecture education is still relevant. I think my short answer would be no. <laughs> and that's why we need to reimagine this whole uh, thing. There's another question about um, the perspective from the perspective of the educator, what are the practices in terms of classroom studio uh, that helps you to reach predominantly an informed, privileged, and a skeptical student body? I think that is a big, <laughs> a big struggle we are also <laughs> encountering, particularly in Ivy League institutions or institutions that are highly, yeah, in a way to what extent we are <laughs> also dealing with the enemy inside and the, the, the role of the elites in education uh, spaces is also very a complicated one that I, it, it would take a whole <laughs> other event perhaps to address but I think for sure that is many times the elephant in the room that we necessarily need to, to talk through. So I think we, we're very happy you, you've been here but I think uh, something that we need to to keep returning to and part, being part of this discussion uh, is going to be present in a couple of more events that we're going to be having in February. Laia is going to share with you precisely learning or inspired by that um, talk by um, Arturo Escobar about re-earthing design. So we are bringing some practitioners to talk and help us to think through about this idea. What does it mean we are thinking this time? What are the practices? How are the limitations, the possibilities? Um, and to what extent also uh, in the engagement of uh, having a critical reading also in the, geo in the diaspora geographies in London, we're gonna be having another event uh, with a great lineup of uh, speakers. We're gonna be making a walk tour trying to connect with the Latino diaspora in London, uh, with the Caribbean diaspora in London, and we're gonna be with Sumi Valley from Counter Space also to think about what is this intersection, the nexus, the nexus between diaspora and design, so we can uh, collectively think together as kind of part of the, of the challenges that we have to engage with, uh, particularly at the, in this time where xenophobic <laughs> sentiments are so crucial and where uh, we have these brutal um, regimes that are uh, highly toxic and violent. So I think uh, for us it's very important to have started this or kick off these conversations and we had a very good turnout and I think it, it's just a sentiment or a testament that it's a, dis a discussion that, that still needs to be happening. So I'm very, very grateful to Leopold and Cruz and Natalie <laughs> and Emma <laughs> to show up today <laughs> to keep the discussion going. So thanks a lot for being here. And I think the role of the designers needs to be imagining, uh, bringing a spatial imagination to actually uh, change this unlivable world that we live in. And I think we uphold and nurture critical and radical hope to make that possible because pessimism is not an option <laughs> for us in this moment. So thanks a lot uh, to all of us for attending and for our great guest and to Laia who has been at the back end of all this process. Uh, so stay tuned to the following events and thanks so much for, for being here with us. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much. I thanks for the great I, questions too. They were <laughs> incredible. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. Um, I think, yeah. Very critical we, participants. <laughs> well, I think it, it, it raised a lot of uh, excitement this, this series. Um, and of course, a big, big part is because of your presence, but also this topic is, is it needs some catalyst spaces also to bring this discussion together. Uh, and I think designers don't find necessarily much spaces to do so in the context, at least of the of the UK. Even though we had or we still have attendees from from all over, as I can see, uh, I can see there. So thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you so much, and I hope to keep up with the conversation in in the following events. Take care, you all. Thank, Thank you, you very everyone. much. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye.